Great. Well, thank you so much. Just wanted to change my name. Uh, it's so great to uh, see you all and to be here with you. Um, I'm joined here by my campaign manager and she'll pop some information into the chat, um, but just you know, happy to be with all of you for a little bit this evening and look forward to meeting you in person. I am State Representative Tammy Govea. I am running for Lieutenant Governor because I quite honestly believe that we deserve leaders in the corner office for putting the health, the well-being, and the dignity of every single person at the center of the ways that we are making decisions. And in a state that is as rich in resources and history and culture and connectedness, connectedness like we are here in Massachusetts, I do think there's so much more we could be doing. I grew up in the city of Lowell and my grandfather was in the Carpenters Union, which put my family on a solid economic footing. Uh, my parents were able to buy a two-family home and rent out the upstairs apartment to help stretch their salaries and their wages. Um, and we certainly were able to weather some of the economic storms that we had while growing up. Um, but we were so lucky compared to so many of my neighbors and my classmates and my friends. Um, I had friends in, in grammar school and elementary school okay. whose parents struggled with substance use disorder and domestic violence. Um, when I was a teenager, I had friends who did not have heat or hot water in the winter time and whose parents experienced medical racism. And I'm 47, and I share that to give you a sense of the fact that I was coming of age, 13, 14, 15 years old, when Lowell became a resettlement location for families fleeing the Khmer Rouge. And so while, um, you know, these families left and, and fled um, very violent, um, horrifying experiences. Uh, when they came to this country and came to Lowell, they were slapped in the face with xenophobia and racism. And that really uh, instilled all of those experiences growing up and so many more, uh, really instilled in me a deep sense of empathy that I carry with me to this day. It also inspired me to wanna eventually go into elected office um, and go into public service. But I don't come from a politically connected family. I don't come from a family of wealth or great influence. So I became a public health social worker and that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. Um, when I was living in Lowell in 2007, I worked with the city manager and the superintendent of police, the heads of the hospitals and the nonprofit organizations, parents and young people to form the Lowell Roundtable on Substance Abuse Prevention. And I approached the city manager with that idea because all of the surrounding suburbs, with maybe the exception of one, all had a substance abuse prevention coalition, but Lowell did not. The center city, which has so many resources and so many needs. And this was 2007, so early in the opioid crisis. And just by working together, um, we were able to secure a million dollars in state and federal grants uh, to support our young people, to pass policies and implement programs uh, to prevent their access to addictive products and then also um, to support greater access to treatment that we still know so many people uh, need to this day uh, because of the opioid crisis and some of the other emerging issues within uh, substance use disorder. It wasn't long after forming this coalition that I became a single parent to my kids who were six and three at the time. They're now 20 and 17 and doing as well as any of our young people are uh, right now, just given the state of the world. Um, but back at that time, and even up until about three years ago, I was uh, really struggling financially, wor worried every single day what's going to happen, if my car breaks down, how am I going to get myself to work, my kids to school, um, really stretching my budget. I had $60 in my grocery budget every single week. And like so many of our families, um, was uninsured through my health insurance company. And so had um, some medical debt that I had to figure out how to try to cover um, all while you know, raising two kids on my own. And so the struggles that so many of our families are experiencing now as a result of COVID and all the complex problems that have come along with that, as well as you know, so many of our families, particularly our families of color, our immigrant families and low-income families, just how much they were really struggling even before the pandemic hit us. And so I'm running for Lieutenant Governor to be a bridge between the corner office and all corners of the state by leveraging my experience as a single parent, my experience as a state representative. I've been serving in the legislature for the last three years 
represent, representing Acton, Concord, Carlisle, and Chumsford, which is where I, I moved to Acton 12 years ago. Um, I want to take that experience. I want to take the experience that I've gained as a doctor of public health. I earned my doctorate in public health in August of 2020. So I want to take those experiences of the ways that I've led out front and behind the scenes um, to make sure that we are doing all that we can to put people at the center of our decision making and our policy making so that we can make it easier for people to access the resources that they need so that we are really uh, moving forward in addressing the climate emergency that is already upon us, our housing crisis, our challenges with transportation and healthcare, and also the cost of, of higher education. So those are the reasons why I'm running. Um, I hope you'll join our campaign. I hope to earn your support and your vote between now and next year. Um, but for right now, I just want to get to know you a little bit and answer any questions that you might have and understand what are some of the issues that are, are big uh, for you in Mansfield and for you and your family. And um, just look forward to chatting a little bit here and getting to know you um, a little bit more as the campaign goes on. So thank you all. Nice. Um, uh, questions for Tammy? Hi, Tammy. Great to Hi, see you so here. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to it's been so long. <laughs> I know. Um, so, you know, we're in this little thing called a pandemic. It's not going away. Yeah. If you have, when you have the opportunity to be Lieutenant Governor, how do you think you might change things up a little bit around the way that the current administration is handling their response to the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, Charlie Baker is a, is a real Republican, really privatized the response to this pandemic in so many ways. And I've I, even before I decided to run for Lieutenant Governor, I was talking to my colleagues in public health all across the state. I was talking to our directors of the councils on aging and our local leaders, and so many of them um, feel so dejected and so left behind by the current administration. It really doesn't matter where you live, whether you're closer to Boston or you're um, on the South Shore or you're in Western Mass. I heard over and over again that our local folks were working together, ready to put shots in people's arms. They just simply never got the vaccine because the administration decided to as is a regular Republican response, let's put together these really large mass vaccination sites, which we know our seniors are gonna have a hard time getting access to, people who don't have access to computers or who don't have the same level of computer literacy that was needed in order to be able to secure a, a vaccine appointment, people who don't have access to transportation or someone who can take the day off of work to bring them to a mass vaccination site. And we're doing the same thing with the booster shot and we're doing the same thing with the ways that we are um, providing testing. We are not providing access to rapid antigen testing. We're saying to people, you know what, go shell out 30, 40, sometimes as low as $20 for a test. Um, three years ago, there's no way I would have been able to afford to get a test that my kid needed in order to be able to get back to school. And if I didn't buy a rapid test, then he would be out of school for five days and he doesn't have COVID. He didn't have COVID, but you know, we're taking all the precautions that we really need to be taking, but we don't have the right testing um, in place. The other thing that I've noticed over and over again, and it's not just with the pandemic, it's with so many other issues is that um, we've tended as a state, particularly under the current administration to bring people with the same kinds of mindsets and approaches to solving problems rather than bringing in people with lived experience, asking people, what would this really look like for you um, if we had these mass vaccination sites? Would you be able to get there? How would you get there? Would it be easy for you? Would it put up barriers? Um, you know, asking some of those basic questions. And that's what you do when you're, you know, really designing programs and policies and interventions that put people at the center, that it's really focused on making it as easy for people to access the resources that they need to keep themselves safe, keep their family safe, and keep our communities and our state safe. So those are some of the things that I would be uh, taking a close look at. The other thing is I would never have punted it down to the local level to make decisions around mask mandates. That is something that he should have taken the hit on um, for the political reasons. You know What he did and not taking the leadership in the early stages of deciding around mask mandates in schools 
is that it pitted neighbor against neighbor. We already know we are in a political firestorm, so much vitriol that is still hanging over from the previous presidential administration and just everything that's going on um, in our state and in our community around white supremacy groups and uh, just the real um, you know, vitriol that's coming at people. And he could have taken the, that hit very easily and he chose not to. He chose to punt it to people who are volunteering to make their schools better places for their children, um, who are not you know, equipped in the ways that uh, he should be equipped to be able to make this decision. So that's just an example of how I would have approached that. I appreciate the question. Thank you. Anything, any other questions for Tammy? Joe? Hi, Joe. Hi, Representative, hi. Nice to see you. Nice to see um, you. This is maybe a somewhat different question that tailgates onto the last one. And I see Senator Chang Diaz is here. I'd, I'd probably ask her the same or to address it as well. Your, um, your comments about Governor Baker are interesting and how we'll do things different or how we can do things better. And of course it's the current administration. So we wanna talk about what will be next. But one thing I believe, and, and not many people do, and probably most people here would disagree with me on this, I think even if Governor Baker runs again, that um, Jeff Dale will be the Republican nominee. What? Um, how, how do you respond to that? <laughs> I don't think we should assume it's gotta be Charlie Baker. Let's put it that way. I certainly, I am not a political operative, so I'm not studying the statistics and the behavior around uh, what voters who are more conservative might or might not do. We do know that unenrolled are a larger proportion of our voting population um, than we would want as Democrats um, and compared to Democratic enrolled and, and Republican enrolled voters. So I think that we should be doing everything that we can, regardless of what happens on the Republican ticket. We should be doing everything we can to go after every single voter and make sure that we are engaging voters who have not been engaged before, that we are truly creating that inclusive democracy that we say that we are so committed to. Um, I, I, I just, uh, I can't even think about what it would look like with on the Republican side. Uh, but it is an interesting, um, it, it's an interesting uh, perspective that you just shared. Um, but I just think regardless of who it is, it's important that Democrats get the message out about what we will do differently, how we are different, and how the current administration and their approach is dangerous to us here in this state. And also having another Republican governor in the corner office, how that's dangerous for our democracy all across the country. That's the message I think that we need to get out, uh, regardless of who the nominee is on the Republican side. But I appreciate the question and I can't wait to hear how Senator Sonia Chang Diaz answers it. It's so <laughs> great to see you. Okay, anything else? Any other questions for Tammy? Tammy, my, my cousin Diane Knight can't stop talking about how wonderful you are. So yeah, that's you're enough, I, enough for I'm, me. <laughs> yeah, she's great. I, I love Diane. Oh my gosh, she's the best. So, well, thank you so much for, for managing us here tonight. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank so, you for um, having us. We'll stick around for a few minutes. Okay, good. Yeah, I probably want to um, welcome to Senator uh, Sonia Chang Diaz, who just joined us. So she is our, our speaker of the night also. So welcome. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I'm um, arriving a little late. I got so you know deep into the rich Q and A um, at another Democratic Tech Committee meeting. I was at. I lost a little track of time, but I'm glad I got to um, hear a little bit um, from, of Tammy, who I always enjoy uh, hearing on the campaign trail, um, and it's been a pleasure to serve with her in the State House. Um, so should I just dive right in? Yeah. Okay, so um, I, you know, I'll just give you guys a, a sort of you know sense about what brings me to this work and what I think we can get done together, um, and then I would love to um, you know let you kick the tires, ask me your hardest questions. Um, you know, I love geeking out on policy, uh, so um, I'll try to leave as much time as possible for that. So you know, I come to this work um, as a mom. Uh, as a former public school teacher, as a state senator, as many of you know, uh, and really as a, as a grassroots organizer uh, by heart and, and by training. Um, I, uh, very simply, I am running for governor because I want to build the commonwealth that we all want our kids to grow up in. Um, it's that fundamental. I grew up 
uh, always feeling like I was moving back and forth between two different worlds. Uh, as a multiracial child of a single mom, uh, growing up in a multi, uh, mostly wealthy white community. Uh, you know, my dad, he came to this country from Costa Rica uh, as an immigrant, and he came with 50 bucks in his pocket and a one-way ticket and very little English. And, um, you know, he had incredible determination, um, but importantly, he also um, along the way had the help of um, teachers and lunch ladies and librarians uh, who invested in him. And because of that help, he made it not only to college, uh, beating the odds, but he made it to space. Uh, and he became NASA's first Latino astronaut. My mom, uh, whose story is less told uh, and less uh, glamorous, uh, but it has an equally uh, big imprint on me. Uh, she is a social worker and uh, a woman of faith. And she spent her career helping women and children uh, who struggle on the margins of society. And, uh, you know, one thing you got to know about her uh, to understand, you know, what makes her tick, and I think in turn, you know, that imprint on me is that my mom knows how to make every dang penny work. Uh, and we saw her growing up stretch our grocery budget with things like soup nights and powdered milk um, to help us get, you know, that, that grocery budget through the week. Uh, but we always somehow she we saw her always manage to ha have enough to give to others somehow and to help a church. She took that incredible grace and grit and um, she cobbled together what privilege she did have and she moved us to Newton where she knew that we would get a first class education. And, you know, by the time I was in high school, uh, I could tell that our family was not like other families uh, in Newton. Um, you know, most of my friends had cars, um, took trips to Europe. We did not have those things. Um, but I got the same great education uh, as the other kids around me. And for that, I am forever grateful. Uh, but I am also forever cognizant of the fact that my story is an exception in that regard. And so when I graduated from college, knowing full well what a difference uh, that education had made in my trajectory, I wanted to pay the debt forward. And so I went, I decided to become a, a teacher in one of the state's poorest and least funded school districts, um, the city of Lynn. Now, uh, I'm curious, any teachers in the Zoom? All right, I see you will. Uh, Deborah, is that a hand up? Yes. Um, so I'll be curious if this uh, resonates with your experience. Um, every day in the classroom, I saw the way that the wealth divide impacted my students. And, you know, um, there was, was never enough paper in the supply closet and kids would be coming to school in the dead of winter without winter coats. Uh, low expectations surrounded them in many cases. And there was just too many kids on each teacher's roster. And, you know, I saw the way that state and local government went above and beyond when it came to caring for the needs of the children of wealthy families, like the ones that I had grown up next to. But, somehow lost that sense of urgency when it came to kids on the margins. And in particular, I saw that state government was just choosing not to see them, right? And was choosing to abandon my kids in Lynn. And, you know, growing up, uh, the answer to any problem with my dad was always, uh, well, what are you gonna do about it? So I became an organizer. And you know, I went out and I organized for the things that I thought would bring about change for my students, right? Voting rights, more women in office, progressive policy change. And when those changes still were not coming, uh, in 2008, I decided to run for office myself. And to the surprise of all the naysayers, I won. And uh, I went on to become the first Latina to serve in the Massachusetts State Senate. Now, it has been, uh, 12 years, a crazy, wild, nonstop 12 years since then. And in that time, I have been fighting nonstop alongside working families. And I have also, again, had that experience of 
going back and forth between two different worlds. You know, now as a legislator representing some of the wealthiest households in the state and the poorest households in the state, and going from um, you know fancy boardrooms in the morning to housing development community rooms at night. And in that back and forth, um, I have discovered uh, that our culture on Beacon Hill lacks a critical ingredient. And that ingredient is urgency, right? We have a government that is full of powerful people, most especially our governor, who believe that government can afford to go small. And we have this chronic you know, condition in Massachusetts. We like to think that we are the best and the brightest and the most progressive, right? But the truth is our systems are failing hundreds of thousands of families. And every time in the past seven years that I have seen working families push for progress, I have also seen the Baker Polito administration be there to block or delay or water down that progress. And that is how today in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you know, we have, we have kids who will work for years to earn their degree, but then get crushed under a mountain of student debt. And we've got, uh, you know, moms and dads who look at their babies and wonder whether the planet that they inherit will sustain them. And we've got black and brown kids and their parents who worry that their next encounter with the police could be their last. And you guys, you know, it does not have to be this way in Massachusetts. And I think as, you know, as democratic activists, you know this better than most, you've got it in your bones, right? That's why you, that's why you do this work of local democracy. It does not have to be this way. And that is why my campaign is focused on building a grassroots movement to reclaim the governor's office for only the second time in three decades. We have got to get it done. And not just for flipping the governor's office, right? For you know, the blue, the red to blue, but it's about being there with the movement also to deliver the systemic change to our biggest and most urgent problems in Massachusetts. And we have got some big ones, right? Tremendous challenges that we're up against. A global health pandemic, an economy that only works for those at the top, a racial reckoning that we're just at the beginning of, uh, the consequences of climate change. Big problems like these, they deserve and they need solutions at a scale to match. And if we are gonna get those solutions, we have got to stop putting people in charge who care more about holding on to power than doing something with that power. We know how to do big things in Massachusetts and we have got to reclaim that muscle memory, right? We have got more millionaires in this state than 46 other states. Think about what we could do with that. We for damn sure can pass a millionaire's tax. And you know we see the wealth divide growing across our state, we could overcome it by investing intentionally in economic mobility. We are a state that should be leading on voting rights and on um, health equity, on decarbonizing our energy use, on building a 21st century transit system. We could close the racial wealth divide in Massachusetts. You know, imagine that. Make it so that our young people's economic fortunes look better and not worse than their parents. This is not a theoretical wish list that I just ticked off, right? These things are possible and within reach in Massachusetts. Don't let anyone tell you that they aren't. And I say this not as an article of faith, right? I say it because I have lived it. I know it is true. I've got the track record of going toe to toe with Charlie Baker uh, and winning on education equity, on criminal justice reform, on transgender equal rights, on uh, vaccine equity, on police reform. But to win this election uh, in November, 2022, we are gonna need a nominee who is unafraid to hold Charlie Baker accountable uh, or Jeff Deal, right? To the question that I know is coming. Um, and we also need, uh, we've got, we need to give frustrated Democrats a reason to turn out. My campaign is gonna be building that movement of grassroots activists, uh, voters of color, working people, young people, progressive voters across this state, building winning coalitions like that uh, to win elections or policy fights against long odds is what I have been doing for the past 12 years. So I know it is possible. Um, I also know that it is not something you do alone. So, you know, I am here um, to ask for your votes, uh, but I am also gonna ask for your sweat equity 
uh, your labors of love, maybe a few dollars if you can chip them in, uh, because that is how we're going to build um, the people powered movement that is going to get us to the win in November 2022. So I'll leave it at there. Uh, and I and I hope we can dive in with whatever are your heart's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank questions you. for Sonia. Yeah, I have one. Uh I was speaking about the some of the problems have been around for decades. For example, I grew up in Newton. I was white, and you know, you know so I was somewhat isolated. But I did know from, you know, you know, with some of the groups were working with people in Boston that at least from 1966 there was a problem with short shortage of drug treatment, and that's still true and probably worse than what it was then. Mm -hmm. There was a housing issue with quality in Boston. Now not now a lot of people don't even have a home. Mm -hmm. So some you know, so problems are and there was a start of the civil rights movement. So it was about the time when they were just beginning to think about racial equality. So that we have three major issues that are over that's been around for I guess over 40 over 50 as a 50 years. I don't know exactly how many years that is. And, the, and as I said, some of them, like the racial things, goes back to the 17th century. So whether we really made much progress, I don't know. Well, Tyler, is your question for me, have we made much progress? And, and I guess how, how would, you know, how would you, if you think that those are the problems, how would you try to really them. start to solve them? Or if you have some other different, see something else that's an issue. Yeah, okay, so I hear housing, um, uh, substance use treatment services um, and uh, racial inequity. Did I get that right? Those are the three I mentioned. I'm not saying that's the only thing. You know, there's issues about transportation, about those yeah. who have cars and stuff like that, and not uh, the others too. But no, certainly there are others. But I I would put those three high on my list. Um, they are issues that um, you know that I care deeply about and have been working on for years. Also, they are th they are high on the list. Uh, you are in good company, right? Everywhere that I'm going across this state. Um, those are, I would say, in the top five or so issues that I hear about um, from your fellow Bay Staters. Um, so I'll try and give you a quick, you know, a quick uh, tick list um, through those. I mean, first of all, on housing, it is every year in Massachusetts, it gets harder and harder to live here, right? The cost of housing is just, you know, keeps going up, up, up. Um, you know, and if and if you can afford to live here, chances are you're worried that your kids are not going to be able to put down roots, you know, or keep roots in the communities that they grew up in and that they, you know, want to raise a family in now. Um, so there's a lot we have to get right here. Um, there are several things, you know, no one silver bullet um, that we need to do. One, you know, we need to put more funding into um, the development and the um, preservation of affordable housing stock, both home ownership and rental. Um, one of the, you know, my favorite pieces of legislation is the Shiro Coalition bill, which would add to the, um, the, de the deeds transfer tax um, fee and split the funding um, that that generates between climate mitigation projects and affordable housing development. I think it's a really smart coalition um, and a really, really smart way to sort of, you know, feed two birds with one hand, if you will. Um, so that's one. You mentioned transportation also is on the list. I think transportation, getting that right, is a huge part of also solving our housing crunch in Massachusetts. Right, we need to expand the zone um, of what's possible. If we have everybody, you know, not everybody, but a huge portion of our state trying to, um, you know, access the jobs in Boston or Greater Boston, there's just not enough space there, right, within the city limits of Boston. We need to make it easier to um, live and work in different parts of the state and get, you know, um, quickly, uh, reliably, and with less, uh, you know, carbon output um, from from work to home and vice versa. Um, and not for nothing, those transit systems will also enliven local economies um, in ways that we have yet to unlock. Um, and I'll, I'll also just mention land trust, I think, is a, another solution that we should be exploring with respect to housing. Um, on substance use, uh, this is a huge issue, right? At the, many of you probably have heard the phrase mass and cast. This is a phrase that rings a bell. That's right. That's, a, that's yeah. what I have heard, heard. And uh, you yeah, know, I went to, is, I am forced there by certain. The, you know, thing, and it was a not too far away when I first realized that there was a housing problem, which was only a few blocks to the north of there, but yeah. Yeah. and so east of there, but we have got to get better uh, with our treatment uh, uh, system, 
our prevention and treatment system in Massachusetts. You know, we have a humanitarian crisis unfolding um, at Mass and Cass, and it's not just people from Boston, right? People from all over the state are congregating in this place because it's where there's a cluster of services, um, and there's also, you know, a community, and there's also supply, honestly, there um, in terms of access to to, to substances. Um, you know, we are not going to be able to incarcerate our way out of this problem, nor should we be, right? Locking up people who are suffering from an illness. Um, so we need to be standing up, you know, uh, more comprehensive, more robust, more accessible um, drug treatment services, um, low threshold transitional housing. Um, you know, I think probably everybody in this Commonwealth, if they didn't experience it themselves, knows somebody or know somebody whose child, right, um, or loved one suffers from um, the affliction of addiction. Um, and, you know, we need to treat it from a public health standpoint. And we also need to lower the cost um, of entry into the field of, um, of being care providers, right, for people who are struggling uh, with substance use disorder. And this gets into uh, my education policy plan. We need to lower the cost of higher education in Massachusetts because so many people are carrying such, you know, huge student debt load. It makes it very hard for them um, to go into or stay in the human services where they are not getting paid enough um, to pay back those student debt. So it's one piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece of the puzzle that we need to make it more affordable to go into these professions so that we can increase the supply of care providers. Um, and then what was the, oh, racial justice. Um, gosh, I mean, do we, I could go for an hour. <laughs> you know, we need to be, uh, you know, weaving uh, racial equity uh, perspectives through all of our work, whether it's environmental, right, climate mitigation, housing, um, transportation policy, right? There's in every one of these, education, public safety, um, we need to be approaching, having a, a racial lens, a racial justice lens on all of those problems. So I, could, I cannot give you a short encapsulation there, but to say this has um, been a through line of my work over the past 12 years. I'll put my website um, in the chat so folks um, can see it before I go. Um, and just, you know, if you, if you look at the work that I've been doing uh, in the legislature on education equity on criminal justice reform, um, you will see that racial justice has been a through line of my work and will continue to be. Awesome. Okay, anything else for Sonia? Yes, please leave us here, um, your website. Thank you, absolutely. Oh, oh, wait, oh. Joe, Joe, you're on mute. You, you did, it's the Jeff Deal question, is it? <laughs> yes, since it was anticipated, I don't wanna, I'm glad Sharon has since joined since I asked because she's one of the few people in the world, I think, who who's seeing what I'm seeing. You know, you have 8% of the 8% of the vote is a Republican and they're very hardcore right. Um, and I just, every, every Republican I know, and I do know some, all but one support Jeff Deal and they support mm -hmm. him strongly. Um, just, and I think Representative Govea answered it the way we all would, I guess. Um, this, but so I don't know if there's anything more you can add, but since it's been thrown out there. Yeah. I mean, I, I uh, look, you know, what the Republican voters and, and Republican leaning um, unenrolled voters choose in their primary, of course, you know, is for them to decide and, and um, we'll, we'll see, right, what time. But um, I, I agree with Tammy, we have to be ready for either. And I'm ready, right, for, for either challenge. Um, I, I will say plainly, you know, I, it is, I think, a, a matter of, of um, sort of common wisdom and that I, agree with that I think Charlie Baker will be a more formidable uh, nominee yeah. in the general election. And that is what I'm gonna be prepared for. And that's what we all as Democrats need to be building the movement now, right? Laying the groundwork now and doing the organizing, building the um, statewide operation to be able to grow our electorate, turn out all of our people uh, in November of 2022. We have to be ready um, for, that, uh, for that level of challenge. Um, and can't, you know, sort of sit back and, and sort of think, you know, that we're going to be able to put it on coast if Jeff Deal is the, um, is the nominee. But, um, you know, either way, I am ready to have that debate, right? I think I, I stand unabashedly on the principles um, of the Democratic Party, right? And, and as a progressive, uh, and I'm ready to have that debate with, with Charlie Baker or Jeff Deal. Great. Thanks. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. Good luck. Thank you so much, you guys, for having me. Yeah. And I will um, pop my information in the chat here and don't be a stranger. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely.